Hey everyone, it is George Kroos. I have been on the road for a very long time and I have not recorded a podcast. I actually record them all in bunches and then I just release them, um, you know, over time so that there's a consistent posting. And so I'm kind of getting back into the swing of things, kind of just trying some stuff out. And it was no better opportunity than to actually welcome uh, Amy Gonzalez. And she is a wonderful principal in the Austin area. I've connected with her years ago. And one of the things that she talks about today in this podcast so well and provides such great examples is the importance of not just, you know, talking about the whole child, but the whole learner. And that includes the adult and really kind of addressing their needs and, and the focus on how do we actually help people, you know, bring out their best in our in our schools? How do we actually help them find their own definition of self-care? What that actually looks like? How do we actually back off um, and trust the people that we work with to make decisions closest to kids? And she models this. Uh, I've known her for years. She did this pre-pandemic. She's been doing a wonderful job during the pandemic. And I know you're going to learn a lot from her. It was so nice to be back, just sit down and have these conversations after uh, a long time on the road. But I know you're going to love this podcast with Amy. She is an absolutely incredible leader. Uh, thanks for taking the time to watch and join the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I know you're going to love this episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed to have the incredible Amy Gonzalez. And I've known Amy for a, a long time. Uh, we've connected through Twitter. We've had a ton of conversations, especially over the last couple of years, um, you know, during the pandemic. And, you know, I've sent lots of video messages to your staff and uh, I'm going to do another one. A little shout out to your staff because hopefully they're listening. Right? Even if you want to just clip that part. But um, Amy <laughs> is absolutely incredible leader. And um, she, she, we were talking before and I always, you know, do a little pre kind of interview before we do the podcast. And she was talking about really how important it is to teach to the whole learner not not just kids but adults as well and everything in my conversations with her in her focus um and we've had some really good conversations i can see that emulated over and over and over again so i am really excited to have you today amy and if you can just kind of like introduce yourself to everybody tell us a little about who you are and how you got to doing what you are doing today Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much, George, for having me here. And thank you for all the engagement with my staff, my Clayton Cardinals. Um, you've been awesome, you know, engaging them on Twitter, sending us the videos during the pandemic and the shutdown. So it was always a good little smile. Um, and so we absolutely appreciate that piece. Right. But um, to, to everybody out there listening, I'm Amy Gonzalez, the proud principal of Nan Clayton Elementary in Austin, Texas. My path is pretty linear. I knew I always wanted to be an educator um, since a very early age. And I knew I wanted to be a principal one day. I wanted to get my doctorate. And um, by I feel very blessed to be able to say that check, check, and um, give me about a year or so to write a dissertation, right. and then I'll have that third check, right? Um, but um, just really happy to be here and um, have um, four awesome kids, um, two middle school, two high school, two girls, two boys, you know, we planned it all, of course. <laughs> right. um, just kidding. So uh, my husband's amazing. He's always been um i joke that the first night i met him i told him all the things i wanted to do so at this point i'm like i told you and uh he's my number one supporter of course next to my family my parents um but he himself is experiencing his first year teaching which is really fun oh. um so our conversations at the dinner table are really cool and i really really love having an opportunity to to have some common language and and share our stories together that so that's that's, that's awesome that um you know just kind of going through that process and probably seeing some of the stuff that you went through and you know like who better to guide someone new and teach you right that'd be awesome so i'd like to think so absolutely it was fun watching him go through his his schooling to be prepared and you know sometimes he's like what do you know i'm like apparently not in the left honey right, so right, right. <laughs> good luck with that one he started he started what year in 2021 or 2020 this is his first year so 21 22 
uh, second year of the pandemic, doesn't know anything right. better. So he's right. he's living his it's best life. He straight, loves it. It's just straight up from here, right? Like, <laughs> if you can get through this year, anybody absolutely. listening, if this is your first year teaching, your first year admin, you've got this. You yeah, can definitely awesome. do this. Hey, so I got I to gotta ask you this question because uh, um, I know you told me this before, but you reminded me when we were talking before the show. You ha- you were a VP. Mm-hmm. And then you went to AP or sorry, to principal in the same school. Were you a teacher there in that same school as well? Okay. So fun fact, my first year there, I was actually halftime fifth grade teacher, halftime assistant principal, full-time grad student. (laughs) Um, And I think my third kid was only like four months old at that time. So, um, but no, I had taught on one campus for nine years prior and then um, moved over, got the position mm. to the assistant principal role. And I took it knowing it was only half time and I would still dabble with the classroom. And then, you know, in the morning I would have class and in the afternoon I would assume those um, assistant principal roles. Um, and then in three years time, I would have never have guessed that's how I started. I would have never have guessed I was going to be the full on principal, you know, in a, such a short amount of time. But my principal at the time had an opportunity to um, seek another um, opportunity. And I was kind of called up and it, it's been awesome hmm. ever since. Okay. So I, I got to ask you this question because, because of the, the split, because there's a lot of conversation that's like, well, every administrator needs to teach. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with that. And, and, and there's, there's a reason, there's a reason for it. Right. And I know some administrators say that, that usually comes from teachers. Right. And it's not that you shouldn't understand the classroom and it, you know, that's not part of it too. But I was an AP who also taught about half time and I felt, and maybe this is just me. And that's what I was curious about asking you. I felt that I was always worried about the whole school that sometimes mm-hmm. the kids in my actual class got the short end of the stick. Like if something was going sure. on that I had to deal is like, is that, is that accurate what I just said? And that's, that's where I kind of struggle with that is that like, there are, there are like, like, you know, kind of whole school things that you have to deal with that need immediate attention that we just kind of like, kind of maybe to the detriment of the kids that are in your classroom. And that's where I always have struggled with that because I remember that experience. And you know, my kid, my kids are like, they're like, Oh, don't worry, Mr. C you just go. Right. <laughs> when I had to that, right? And they were just used to me, like having to like bolt in the middle of a class. Because right. of not. Did you find right. that at all? Or is that just a Canadian experience? <laughs> no, I, I definitely can, can make a connection with that because it's so tempting. Again, I was itching to get into that administrative role mm. at that point in time too. So it may have not even been that something actually took me away. It's my mind was going, right? right? right. So I, I'm in front of my kids. We we just did a really great writing lesson and you know, there's some independent writing going on. And, you know, I'm circling the room, but I'm like, okay, and then I'm going to go do an observation after this. And I'm going to, don't forget, I have lunch duty during this time. And I know I, so I found myself wandering and having to constantly redirect myself back into, you know, that space and being with the kids in front of me, because absolutely they needed to come first. um, And I needed to be intentional about that. So the the second year when that was potentially going to still be the case, I was like, Oof, it's time to shut the classroom teacher door and just walk through, right. you know, the AP door, which I was able to then go into a full time position because I don't think two years would not have been successful, in my opinion. Yeah. And there, there's, a, there's an understanding of that sometimes um, schools do not have the budgets, the, the right. you know, the, the student size that they can actually support a full time AP. Mm-hmm. So I, I understand that aspect of it. But it is like there is these other aspects of things that you do have to take care of. And it's, it should never be to the detriment of any single or individual class. And that's, that was always my Agreed. concern. With that. So that, that's something I thought about. So here's another question for you. And I, this, as soon as you told me, went from AP to principal in the same school, tell us about that transition. How was it? Like, you know, a lot of times when like, uh, if someone would say to me like, Hey, if I could be principal at the same school, I would be. I'm like, nah, you should you should go to a different school because they're gonna maybe see you in like AP role 
forever. Right. So like you're, you're, you're actually, you know, you, you kind of go against the advice that I give somebody, but you've done a very amazing job. So tell us a little bit about that transition. I appreciate that. Yes. And that's funny because I did receive that advice. So right. <laughs> that advice is absolutely I, circulating. Yeah. And I, and I hear that, but, um, I think for my campus, um, it was a, it was a very unexpected sudden move that the principal, she was the founding principal. Right. And so she left over the summertime. So this was unexpected. They, they left the, they left the school year thinking we've got our principal, we've got our AP, right. this is, you know, things are going well, we're going to do great. And so with that transition happening over the summer, I was very intentional that I knew I was following into some big shoes, right? Like this was gonna, I had to be very, very intentional with my every move. And I'm gonna tell you my very first day with my staff, August of that year was, I know that this was unexpected. I am right. fully aware of that. And I wanna honor and, and respect all of your feelings right now, because nobody, including myself, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> expected to be the person leading professional development that school year because it just wasn't it just wasn't even on my mind. Right. And I don't think it was on the mind of our staff. And I mean, we're talking, oh, gosh, 10, 10 years that that principal was there and that staff had been there. So I, I think that I made that transition as successful as it could be because I was fully aware of the just the understanding and the empathy for my staff of like, hey, I know this was a lot for all of us to swallow, but I'm here and I know where we left off and I know where we were going. Right. Let me do that with you. And I had um, one of my APs was actually had been a principal, uh, I'm sorry, a teacher there. So yeah. she had familiarity. We brought in at that point in time, I got to have two, um, uh, one and a half APs again. And so I brought mm -hmm. in a half time. We had a collective vision. We knew what we wanted to achieve that first year out. And, um, and I think that that helped immensely. So I think just understanding almost the shock that my staff right. had gone through um, during that summertime and, and being fully aware of that and not not ignoring it. I think sometimes people don't want to just like say what's actually going on, right? Like, no, this is a really big thing. And I absolutely understand, but we're going to get through it together. And, and it's been a great six years. Yeah. And I think, I think for me, um, one of the things that I, I felt like where I was AP, I could have become the principal at some point. And it was not, not necessarily because I'm not saying because of my ability, like I became principal somewhere else. But it was because of the way that my principal treated me and interacted with me. And he kind of presented me almost like a, not necessarily like a co-principal, but kind of, right? Sure. Like, like we, we are a team and like, you know, George is, you know, not like if, if you go to him, you're going to me and vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of like an interesting thing. So he set me up in a space that if it were to go to that. And I, I think sometimes uh, staff feel comfortable they're like, hey, I'd rather have someone who's already been in the school, know who knows Absolutely. the culture, who knows us, you know, go over that because, you know, I don't want to have to Google who this new person is, right? And freak right. out what, what's going on. So, but on the other hand too, there's there's also like, oh, like the, if you put the, you can put the AP in a position where they aren't treated that well by the principal and then they become the principal and then it's like, oh, we can like control that person. Right. And if I, if I may add, George, I think the other thing, and this is really just some advice I want to put out there is I really felt those three years as an assistant principal, I really went under the mantra of every day is an interview, right? right. So every interaction I had with my staff, every relationship that I was building, whether it was with the family, the students or the staff, I was very aware of that because I really believe, you know, wherever you are, if you're wanting to go, you know, right. whether it was from the classroom into the admin or from the AP to the principal, every day is an interview. They're always watching you. Like right. you just can't get away from that. And I think because of that tensionality of just how I presented myself also, it was like, okay, no, she can do this. She, you know, we, we've got some trust in her. We, we can do this. And I think that that also helped that transition. I love that. And, and I got to ask you this. You said your kids go to your school, correct? 
I do. My my two younger ones are ten. Yes, they do. So I want I'm gonna share this. I'm gonna I'm gonna hear if you if you know this term. Okay, it's like one of my favorite terms, but I I never use it. It's called dog fooding. Have you ever heard that term? I cannot say that I have. No sir. So, so dog fooding is is a terminology, and may, like I swear that's what the term is. It's like when someone owns a restaurant, but they wouldn't eat at that restaurant, right? Got and it. it's like, and so like you know, like I like that. So when you actually would put your kids in your own school, that is a great sign. Do you know what I mean? And, and, I, and know, any classroom. Absolutely. I know I exactly that. what you mean. Because again, mm -hmm. when I started as halftime AP, halftime teacher, never realizing I would get a full-time principalship there, my mm -hmm. kiddos were already in their neighborhood school. They were, the older two were already established. Right. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to pick them up and make them right. come here. I remember the first day I did walkthroughs, right? Whatever you may call them, observations, walkthroughs, you know, whatever yeah. your scoring system is. And it was in a kindergarten classroom and I had a kindergarten at that time. Like, oh my gosh, I want to drive to her school, pick up my daughter and come plop her in this That's space awesome. That's awesome. because it was that amazing. And so it took time, but finally now I've got my kids, my old, my younger two are there to which my older two are like, must be nice. We didn't get to go to your school. Right, right. <laughs> like, well, hey, that, so that's sorry. That's uh, Amy. That's Amy uh, taking care of Amy ten years from now, right? That, that's that's what that is, <laughs> you right? Got it. You got it. You got it. Exactly. It. So, hey, we were talking before the podcast. Um, your focus on the whole child and how important that is. I think that's a conversation that's been had by so many people. So, I actually want to focus on the other aspect that you talked about is the whole teacher, and especially mm -hmm. in a time where people are feeling super overwhelmed. Uh, you see like uh, the great resignation. It's not just education uh, yeah. that's happening kind of all over the place. And I think it's, you know, obviously there's some aspect of like rising inflation, you know, pay is not, you know, keeping up with that. But I think it's also, um, like, I can't remember the, the exact phrase, but it's like a lot of times when people complain uh, about money, it's actually not about like at, at their work, it's right. actually not about money. And it's sure. about, it's about other aspects of it. And it's not, I'm not, by the way, that's not like a don't pay teachers more comment, <laughs> but it's like, it, it, it gets fr like, it's like, sometimes you're trying to control these, these aspects because you're not feeling respected and you're not feeling this and you're like, mm -hmm. well, at least give me this. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, like, we, you know, I think every great teacher des deserves all of the things, but how, like, how, especially in the last couple of years, you know, not mm -hmm. that you obviously, and this is something, it's not like, I know you well enough that you weren't like, oh, COVID, now let's start focusing on this. This is like, but especially the last couple of years, like, what does that look like? What, what do you mean by that when you yeah. consider that? Well, I love that you just mentioned real quick. So what, what I'm doing now is not that much different than what I was doing, hmm. you know, the, so here's the fun fact. Six years, three before the pandemic, three technically in the pandemic, right? So that perspective, I think, is I reflect on that constantly. Before the pandemic started, I'd already talked to my staff about, um, you know, dare I say this because some some will roll their eyes, but self care, right? And and right. and I said this, and it's not a buzzword. It's not a buzzword on my right. campus. It truly means something. And I've been very adamant of, and it means something different to every single one. Yeah. My self-care is not your self-care, right? And and so forth. So I always encourage myself, whatever it is, whatever brings you that peace, whatever calms you down, whatever de-stresses and you know, how you decompress, do that mm -hmm. intentionally and as often as you can. So we were already operating in that manner. I had, I would put out Google Forms. I got this idea from a colleague and it's just like a check-in, like, hey, how are things going on a scale of one to 10? Here's where I'm at. This is something that I'm super proud of. I went, you know, and my staff be like, I went jogging the, for the first time and you know, this, you know, great, awesome. So I was constantly checking in with them. I was modeling that myself. I was, you know, I know you've got a wonderful fitness journey, but mm -hmm. I was on a fitness journey. I was doing you know, going to the gym and, and really working on my eating habits and, and modeling that piece. And I yeah. always said family first. So when my older two weren't on my campus and they had a field trip, I would take a day off and go on the right. field trip with them because I'm a mom first. Mm -hmm. And I would have staff say, 
wow, you really get it. Like, thank you for modeling that. I don't feel guilty now because I'm taking care of my mother who's sick and I have to take a day off. Like, no, why, why do we make teachers feel guilty for taking care of their own? I just don't understand that. But so all of that continued with like a hyper intensity in the past two right. years, right? right? I mean, we literally just hit our two year anniversary of we left school one day, never knowing we were coming back to that in that manner, the rest of the school year. Um, mm -hmm. So those Google forms, I mean, th those first couple of weeks of the pandemic shutdown, when we weren't in our buildings, we were on Zoom with our students, I was sending a weekly Google form like, what do you need help with right now? What technology can we support you with? Like, what are you doing for yourself? Um, and, you know, and getting that feedback. Now, here's the trick to those, though. When you get those responses, you got to respond back. Um, and I think that's where some administrators stop. They're just getting all that. No, this teacher just poured their heart and soul out. If I don't acknowledge that, what am I telling them? What's the value of them sharing that with me? So, you know, in that sense, that psychological safety, I think is really important. And I, and I hope, and I feel like I provided that for them. Since we've been in the building, it, I tell them all the time, I know this taco isn't gonna make the pandemic go away, but if I can see you smile for a couple of minutes, it's worth it. Depends, right? It depends on the taco, right? No, it doesn't. Well, depend. the ones I bring, they're good. They're solid. They, they got my stamp of approval, so they're good. But I've been a, I'm a very positive person, and sometimes it, yeah. it's, it annoys people, right? But here's what I say: like, I'm positive in the sense that I acknowledge the darkness, mm -hmm. but I know there is light. I can see the light seeping through and that's where my positivity shines. So I absolutely acknowledge this is hard. Oh my gosh, what are we doing? This is crazy. But I know we can do it because that's who we are. You've already proven that to me prior to a pandemic, who we are, and we're gonna get there too, but we're gonna have to do it together because if we're not doing it together and we're working in silos, someone's going to miss out. Right. Um, and so right now, the question, you know, very long story longer is um, it's just being mindful. I'm super particular. Here's one thing that I've seen on, on Twitter. And you know, I talked a little bit about some Twitter stuff here and there, but mm -hmm. I no longer carry over or hold over my staff's head of the whole genes, right? There's a whole, you know, literature on genes on Twitter, uh, whether you should let your staff wear jeans or not. You are coming into my school building willingly <laughs> and for the most part, joyfully. I don't care what you wear. Right, right. Come on in and teach our kiddos because that's what I know you can do despite what you are wearing and right. let's all move forward. I, I, I gotta be, I gotta be honest. Yeah. I missed hashtag jeans talk. I don't know. If that's <laughs> I did, I it's don't know out if there. It's out there, George. Right. Uh, okay. you know, and I was one of those principles. I was one of those principles before the pandemic. Like if you do this, you can wear jeans on right. this day. Right. So it's one of those little rewards we could give. Um, and I'm absolutely guilty of that. And in my reflection, why, right. why do I, why did I do that? Why does my, why do my teachers have to, that's one of those things where, okay, that was pre pandemic. We're getting, we're moving forward and I, I'm tossing that. And you guys are going to come into my building. You're going to look professional, whatever it is that you choose to wear. And if right. it's jeans every day, my kids are still going to learn. I'm not concerned. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I like that, that to me. Okay. So. This is gonna be a little controversial, maybe, and this is something I heard. And people say the pandemic, like, and I'm like, is it the pandemic or a reaction to it? Because those are two different mm -hmm. things. Like, COVID didn't say anything about genes, right. right? Right? Someone else did, and I think you know some of the some of the policies, some of the things that are happening that are actually causing some of the stress, and then to blame blame a, a virus for making a policy is not necessarily the best thing. And I think that we're causing, like, I shouldn't say we, right? But I've seen it where it's like, maybe it's that thing that we're doing that's causing the stress, right? And so it's great that you kind of identified, like, here's something I was doing that was, you know, make, exasperating the situation. 
And Mm -hmm. like, like now I got to change this because that is a response to that, that thing. Right. And I think, I think for me, especially as a a leader, when you talk about self-care, I think part of it, um, I would say I was a pretty like chill principal, right? Like I was pretty chill and like, you know, like I remember parents coming in saying, my kid can't read. And like, you know, they're so behind this teacher. I'm like, your kid is going to be fine. Just every kids grow at different times. Just, just chill out. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember actually talking to a parent that I had this conversation with and her kids like, you know, doing very well. They're in college now. I said, remember I told you, remember I told you about (laughs) your kid being fine. And I think sometimes that sometimes when, uh, like when there's, when there's, when there's pressure on you and you apply it back, that's when people tend to break. Right? right. As opposed to just kind of accepting it and then just kind of like, just, let's just, let's just calm down. Let's just relax. And I think that kind of sets the tone, um, at the, the leader level is that, it, you know, it, it's pretty easy to panic when your administrators are pack, panicking. Right. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not saying there's ever, there's never a situation where there shouldn't be like, you know, high levels of concern and like that, but we do kind of have to like be cognizant of that because it, it is, I think a lot of the stress that's happening is not because of COVID. It could be because of the reaction. Is it my, am I totally out there saying that? No, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. And, and what I've tra- started to tell my staff is next year, you know, so, so we are, there's a pandemic that occurred. We've all experienced it in different ways, which I think is something else to be, you know, yep. what you're like cognizant of, you know, my, my experience of COVID is both of my husband and I still had jobs. Um, you know, our kids yep. were healthy. We didn't lose a, a, a member of our family. Like that was my experience, mm-hmm. but I know that that was not right. The experience of all. And so just back to that positive piece of understanding how dark these times were for many. Mm-hmm. Um, but knowing that we can go forward and I'm calling next year, I'm just going to coin it as a restoration year, mm-hmm. right? Cause when you're restoring something, it's like, you want to make it pretty again, <laughs> right? right? Or add something to it to make it pretty. And so, you know, I think a lot of reflecting should be going on. It's certainly going on with myself and my leadership team of what are some of those things before we want to take, what have we learned? in these two years that we're like, oh my gosh, why haven't we been doing that? Right? Mm-hmm. Because we learned a lot in these last two years. And and then let's make next year, and and I would say even for the remainder of this year, right? But they're, you know, so many just, they're locked in, this is what we're doing. And, and you know, and it might not allow for some flexibility or, or different time of planning or thinking, but I, I really think next year is gonna be like a year of restoration for all. Um, and healing as well. Um, and, and we cannot ignore what has just happened, but we cannot continue to blame what has happened. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the path I want to lead my school community in when I'm thinking and planning for next year. Yeah. And and like, I, I really appreciate you acknowledging that the experience is a very individual one right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is going through something different. And I think too often we, we don't, we don't acknowledge the individual experience. And then we try to like group everyone in, right? And that can be on the good side or the bad side, right? And I think it's like really kind of the, the whole notion for me, when we talk about, um, there's so much conversation about personalization of education for the last, you know, 15, 20, probably long before my time. And that, mean, re- that means really knowing who people are and understanding mm-hmm. what they go through and what they're bringing to the table, what strengths and passions they have. And as opposed to just kind of lumping people all into, you know, similar groups. I think that's a really important point. And this actually goes back, and this is the last thing I'm going to ask you about. Um, I, I have, I will be 100% honest that I have been always focused on let's do what's best for kids. Mm-hmm. And sometimes to a fault that I will say, like, I don't really care what you have to say. This is what's best for kids. Right. So to the detriment of adults, Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I want to, I want to be first one to call myself out on this. And so what I've really tried to recognize and, you know, as you kind of alluded to is when you take care of the adults, you are taking care of the kids. 
in, in many ways, 100%. right? And so mm -hmm. you talk about this idea of happy teachers, happy students. What do you mean by yeah. that? And what does that look like in your school? Uh, What's well, on my Twitter profile? No, <laughs> um, you know, I say I say I'm a kids first leader, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what we started on our campus is all kids, all day, every day, right? So mm -hmm. kids first. But I say this all the time. My staff, oh, you are could if you couldn't be any closer to second than <laughs> than being in first, because I do right. believe if we take care of our teachers they will in turn take care of our kids to the best of their ability. And I don't lose sight of that. I absolutely hear what you're saying. You know, actually you made me pause and reflect George, like, Hmm, what decisions have I made right. and how have any, if any impacted my adult staff negatively, right? Because I say that all kids all day, every day, I say in the same breath, happy mm -hmm. teachers equal happy students. But I think you can deep, I think you can absolutely separate the two out. So when I say happy teachers equal happy students, if there's, you know, something that maybe came down from um, whether it's from the state agency or, you know, uh, district leaders, you know, above me has said this, I go to my office staff and I'm like, okay, guys, I know this is going to put a little bit more work on us. Right. But you know what? Instead of our teachers counting kids every, you know, whatever the thing might be, we're going to take care of it. Right. And so because that's one less thing that they don't have to do on top of the myriad of hundreds of other things they have to do. So it's kind of like it's a balance. Right. So I, I think of in one capacity, I'm taking off their plate the very few things I can. I will do that. I will deflect where I can deflect. I will take off where I can take off because. I need them focused on those little people in front of them because that's why they're there. Right. And if I haven't created the environment and the space or even the culture that that's why we're here, like we wouldn't have jobs right. if we didn't have children in front of us. So why would I create anything but a safe and positive environment to do right. best in front of the kids? So I'm not sure if I hit, hit it quite mm -hmm. the nail on the head, but those are kind of my thoughts as a leader at this time. Well, here, here's, so here's an analogy outside of education profession, right? So I remember that I was flying on an airline. I won't say which one, mm -hmm. right? So I don't like doing that, but I, there is an issue with a flight. And so I went and talked to a person said, Hey, like, I, I don't have a bag that's checked. I got my bag with me. Can you just put me mm -hmm. on this flight? And they're like, well, I have to talk to someone here. I said, but you can do it. And they're like, but I need permission before I can do it. I'm like, but you know, the common sense thing to do is there's a, there's a seat available. Right. Just, just put me on that seat. You know, like I, I have frequent flyer status. Why do you have to like make this call for someone else to give you permission to do the thing that you know makes the most sense? And so the, so the reason I bring this up is because the micromanaging in that organization puts the employee in a really bad position. So they're kind they're like, I know, like, they're like, I know, but I have to do this or if I'm going to get in trouble. So they're yeah. in a crappy position. And then what happens? The customer is mad, right? So you're putting, mm -hmm. you're putting that. And I think a lot of times we do that in education where it's like the person closest to the kid needs to be able to make the best decision but then we've taken away that power for them because we know what's best mm -hmm. for kids even though we're not you know teaching them right now we're not close to them and all the other stuff whereas like that analogy how does that how do we actually take that and like where do we do that where do we actually take the decision making ability away where do we actually you know actually get the teacher mad and they can it's just an easy fix and, right. and then it actually hurts the, the kid Right. So that's, that's, what, that, that's what I kind of thought about too, because I think a lot of people, um, you know, it's, it's not just an education thing. I've seen it all over the place. And right. Right. Uh, if you, hire, if you hire great people, right. That like great people do great work. Right. But Absolutely. If you, you've already had an issue in your hiring process. If you don't trust them, that's then, you, they, then that's on you. So I think, that's you know, I think that's great. And I just want to add that, you know, I don't know, you know, if you were aware of, of all the districts, you know, around the US that were doing the half virtual, half in person simultaneously. 
right? Oh, so so <laughs> my teachers were teaching to 10 kids on the screen, 10 kids in right. front of them and making it happen. And I said, guy, yeah, I've been a teacher. I've got that experience. I've never been a teacher in a pandemic. No. You are actually, you have now become the expert of your curriculum and your teaching because I have never experienced that. Right. And, and because they want to like, I, I, granted, I had a lot of people turn to me. I'm like, I want to help you, <laughs> but you know more than I do at this point in time. And I recognize that. But if right. I had come around and said, and this is how you're going to teach and you right. will teach it at this time and you will use this platform. Absolutely not. Like right. we, I had to trust my staff as the professionals right. that they are, that they knew what was best and what worked for them. And I let them do it. And, and they did a beautiful job because yeah. one thing that we say in Austin is, make progress personal and every student progressed and that's all i could ask for from them so this this is a beautiful way to end the podcast because it's a testament to because what you said is easy when times are easy right mm -hmm. but when things are hard that's when people tend to want to take control that's when people right. tend to want to you know but to like trust when it's hard when it's harder to do so because of circumstances that's when you find out like when, how great a leader is. So that, I, I love that. And I know uh, as a, a educational leader administrator, you probably never get the kudos that you deserve. Um, and neither do your teachers, even though I'm sure you fill them with, but all the kids they impact, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they never, we hear from just a small percentage of them in our future. So uh, right. I want to be at least one person closer to, you know, just celebrating you. So Amy, thank you so much her taking your spring break time to join me <laughs> i'm so ridiculous but um thanks for having Love me and every, everyone uh make sure you connect with amy she is an absolutely wonderful leader you can see her twitter amy gonzalez 622 um and you can learn from her in so many different ways and i look forward to when you are the head of education in texas because that's <laughs> calling right now you remember this okay, okay. Called, it on the, called it on the podcast you heard okay, it here. I will make you proud, and then all those who supported me. There you, we go. You've already, you've already made it. me proud. You've already made me proud. It's just the next step. So just you're remember. awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Spring break or not, it's been a great <laughs> time. Break. Okay, thanks everyone, Amy. Thank you so much for being on. Have a wonderful day.